Okay, I think that's going. Alright, well, um, a little bit about me. I'm going to start my name is John Terry. I'm the youth pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Um, I've been there, it's been nine years this July. Um, I have a wife named Ashley. She's awesome, a great wife. She's put up with me for 10 years. Uh, we had our 10 year anniversary just a couple weeks ago. I have three children. Uh, one is named Sarah. She turned six last week. Samuel is our three and a half year old. And then Jillian uh, turned one in March. Um, so that's my family. I guess I need to thank and thank RYM uh, for asking me to teach this elective, uh, for entrusting this uh, to me. Uh, similar to what Stacy Cross said, I feel honored uh, to be able to teach this class. Um, well, I, I thank you. I'm very thankful that we would trust in such a huge topic uh, that we'll be uh, discussing. And, and like I said, you know, this is such a big topic. We won't be able, there's so much we just won't be able to cover. Um, I hope to, to hit on many truths that you can carry with you, that you can, can learn from. Uh, but there's just so much where we're just uh, going to have to kind of fly right by. Um, and just kind of get you thinking about how big this topic is. Um, Try to think of one aspect of your life that is not impacted by the internet, or music, or movies. Try to think of just one aspect of your life where, where those three spheres of our culture don't have any impact on. Um, you, you know, the, the, all of these things put such a huge part in shaping my entire culture. And just a recent example, I know every one of you in here probably watches the Food Network and are very popular among middle schoolers. Um, but I don't know if y'all are aware that recently um, a Food Network employee was fired. Have y'all heard about this in the news? Some of y'all? Um, you know, millionaire woman, powerful woman, uh, fired from the Food Network. And, and you can make a very good case that she was fired because of social media. Um, so many people got on Twitter and sort of demanding for this woman to be fired. You can make a good argument that it was ultimately Twitter giving people, you know, the world um, a voice to speak out on the firing of this powerful woman. Um, another example, um, there's uh, a public service announcement that many actors have put together, uh, like Matt Damon, um, Morgan Freeman, uh, many others, uh, demanding no nu- nuclear weapon. Um, so you have actors in movies basically thinking they have more power than the President of the United States, telling him to get rid of nuclear weapons. They're using hashtags on Twitter as well. I think hashtag is demand zero. So you only have actors now that are seemingly just as powerful as the President of the United States of America telling them, you know, what policies to enforce. Um, so again, those are just two small examples of how, how much the internet, how much music, how much movies shape the culture that we're in. Um, so kind of an overview for the week. Um, I would encourage you, I uh, hope you brought your Bible. Um, I would encourage you to take notes. I know some of y'all probably stayed up a little too late. Last night, some of y'all are probably kind of tired. Um, but, but I find, at least for myself, taking notes helps me to stay focused. And I, I like to take notes, so I try to have a simple format for everybody to follow so you kind of know where I'm going. Um, and so the overview for the week, the first point we'll have every day, we'll have a theological foundation that we're looking at. That'll be our first point. What's the foundation? Somebody tell me. Okay, solid ground for the study to be built upon. And the foundation of the building that's ultimately holding everything else. And so we'll have a theological foundation that the entire lecture will kind of be built off of each day. And I'll have one theological foundation. Like today we're going to be looking at the internet. Uh, tomorrow we'll be looking at music. And then the last day we'll be looking at, at movies. Um, but I have a theological foundation today that's applied to the internet, but it's easily applicable to music and to movies. We will be focused on the internet today. So, the theological foundation first. Then we'll have, whoops, going backwards, sorry. Then we'll have the good, 
the bad, and then the solution. So that's our basic outline for the day. And the good, the bad, and the solution is basically just another way to say creation, fall, redemption. And some of you all may be familiar with that pattern in scripture. You know, we have creation in the beginning. Genesis 1 and 2. Everything is good. Everything is perfect. And sin comes along. That's the bad. Tarnishes the good creation. And the solution is redemption. We had Jesus Christ came. He inaugurated his kingdom when he came first. And he'll fully consummate his kingdom upon his return. Um, so the good is basically, you know, looking at the fact that even though sin is in this world, God's fingerprints are still in this creation. But there are good aspects to the internet. There are good aspects to music and to movies. Or we can go in. But at the same time, there is that. There, there is plenty of evil in these things. And I think typically those are kind of the easier things to focus on. This is bad. And then we'll look at the solution. It's taking the good in light of the bad and how we can interact with that as Christians. So Pharisees, legalists, wanted to throw these things away. You know, the internet's bad, let's just not deal with it. Music has, you know, bad lyrics, let's just not deal with it. Let's just abstain from movies completely because there's so much evil. But we as Christians, part of our sanctification is figuring out how can we interact with these things in a way that, that honors God. And so again, that, that's our basic format for the week. Uh, if we have time, we, we might have some questions at the end. Um, if we run out of time, probably the, the better way to do this is just take a sheet of paper you know, from your notebook, um, jot a question down if you don't want to ask it in front of everybody. You can bring it up to me afterwards and I might be able to answer it the following day. Um, that'll give me time to think up an answer or just throw your question away. And not know it's too smart for me. Um, so that's our basic uh, overview um, for the entire week. So today, like I said, we're going to look at the Internet, and, and we're not just simply looking at the Internet. Uh, we'll look at you know, social media, smartphones, technology, kind of lumped in together. You know, they're all fairly connected. Um, so that's what we'll be dealing with today. So the good, or I'm sorry, first, the theological foundation before we get into the good. If you do have Bibles with you, please turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I'm talking about putting it up on the overhead, but I wanted people to bring their Bibles. So, um, just you know, for tomorrow, bring your Bibles if you don't have it with you. Psalm 139 is an awesome psalm. We're just going to look at verses 1 through 16. 1 through 16. And I, I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Version. It's a little bit different than um, some of y'all. Some of you might have this, this version as well. But Psalm 139. Verses 1 through 16. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You've encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This extraordinary knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Verse 13. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. So our theological foundation for today is God's sovereignty. And there, there is so much in this psalm going on. You could, you could preach a sermon series from this psalm. But just highlighting some of what he, what he said there, he says, you, you know, God, you know when I wake up in the morning. God, you know when I go to bed at night. Now look, just those two things, just those two little verses, 
Those are two things you never know. You realize that? You never know the exact second you wake up. That you don't know when you finally regain consciousness from coming back from, from dreaming. God knows the exact millisecond you wake up. You're too tired and groggy. You have no idea what time you went to bed last night. You don't know if it was the first time your youth worker actually had a bed or the seventh time, like my guys did last night. Um, you have no idea when you finally just start drifting off to sleep. These are just two things I took from this one verse that you have no idea the answer to, and God does. Because He knows all of the words before they come out of your mouth. He knows how many words you're going to speak today. He knows what you're going to say to everybody. It also says He discerns your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking at this very second. He knows the guy you're thinking about. He knows the girl you're possibly thinking about. He knows if you're daydreaming about. He knows if you're really paying attention or not. Some of you can fool me and act like you're listening to me and not every now and then. Um, and I don't know if you're listening to me or not. God does. God knows all of that. Um, and so, so we need to see God as this reigning and ruling God who's sovereign over all of us. Look, He knows what you're looking at on the internet when you think nobody's watching. He knows what you're looking up. He knows what you're typing into the Google search when you think you've fooled your entire family and they're not in the room. He knows that. And so, so while I want this, God's sovereignty, we have our theological foundation is because we need to be reminded of the fact that none of this caught God off guard. Typically, we think of the Internet almost as a nasty word. God is in control. He's saying, hey, listen, I know all of these things, all of these thoughts that he's, he's ever known before we think them. He knows the geniuses that are coming up with advancements to the Internet that we have no clue about. He knows about this coming. He's saying, I'm ruling, I'm running. These guys think they're in control. I'm in control. We need to know that none of this call got off guard. And, you know, like I said, I was talking about my family. I have three children. Um, something we do on Sunday, typically we, we call Sunday the Lord's Day. Um, one of our uh, senior professors said this. It's interesting when we call it the Lord's Day, how, how differently we treat that day. Um, so we try to have, we call it the Lord's Day. Uh, first off, also my, my children, they have sugary cereal on the Lord's Day. They get very excited to get in Cocoa Pops or Tricks or, or whatever because it's a celebration. You know, every, every Lord's Day, we're celebrating Christ's birth, His death, His resurrection. And so it's a celebration. And we have a lot of dessert, too, on that day as well. And so as my children are eating dessert, we typically go through the children's catechism. And so we, we you know, ask the question, some of you are familiar with, who made you? Come on, easy answer. Oh, God. There you go. What else did God make? Why did God make you in all things? All right, now applying that to the internet. Who made the internet? Why did God make the internet? For His own glory. But what you must see and know is that while the internet has many evils, while there are many sickening things on the internet, God made it. And God made it to display His glory. There is good in it. So as Christians, we cannot hate technology. Listen, if you hate the internet, if you hate technology, that is questioning God's sovereignty. That's why this is a, a theological foundation. To just hate it, to dismiss it, would be questioning God's control over that. So we need to see it as, as a gift from God. Yes, we'll get into the caution, and we can even say as Christians, there are things we can hate about the internet, like pornography. We can hate that. But there's still good things about it. And so, y'all tell me. I know there, there are a few people in here. But what are some good things about the internet? If somebody wants to raise their hand, shout them out. What are some good things? Define what words mean. Alright, word define what words mean. Etymology of words, yes. Yeah, a Bible app. That's right. Are you recording videos from YouTube, teaching you things? Oh, okay, that's good. Yes. Okay, learning more about the world. I mean, think about I mean, Google Earth. I mean, that, that's so cool that you can see parts of the world that you've never been able to visit and might never ever, ever be able to visit. 
And right from the star lamb. That's a big one, for sure. Last one. Okay, help you do a report, not plagiarize. That's right. But help you do a report. Very good. Careful choice of words. Um, Alright, so let's do this picture here. Um, now, what's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Not going to the restroom. I know people would naturally kind of laugh and stick or something. Go ahead and throw that one out there. Um, the first thing you do when you wake up, look, 90% of young people wake up with their smartphone and bed with them. Um, they often check Facebook, Instagram, surf the internet, listen, before they get out of bed or brush their teeth. It's the first thing most people do. Um, one third of young women check Facebook first thing in the morning. So, uh, you know, why do these people check their smartphones? What, what are they looking for? We need a text from friends, a like on Instagram and Facebook to give you meaning in the morning. Um, now look, there's much idolatry that's taking place there and we'll get into that for sure. But we're looking at the good. So what, what are these people trying to do? That they're desiring community. They're desiring to, to be connected to other people. And, and why, why, you know, since we're looking at the good, what, what, what do we have to point to from Scripture to say this is a good thing? Genesis 1, 26 through 27. God is making us in His image in this section. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And you notice the, the words there, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image. Not images, image. So look, every one of you has been created in the image of God. And we have God as three persons. So, you were created in the image of a single guy and three persons. So community is hardwired into you. It is in your DNA. There's no escaping it. And so getting up with your smartphone to check out Facebook, to check out Instagram, you're actually just affirming your theology about the Trinity. That you're created in the image of this triune God. I mean, in social media, that's the, the good thing about it. It helps us be connected and be in community. I mean, think of a movie example, even though we're not on movies today. How many of you have seen Castaway? Raise your hand if you've seen that. I know some of you might not have. Even if you haven't seen it, um, you know, Tom Hanks is standing on the island alone. But is, is he alone on the island? There you go. He has this volleyball thing. Do you all know about this volleyball? What's the volleyball's name? Okay, what is he telling us there? That he needs to be in community. That a person will go insane if they don't have another human being to talk to. And so they make another human being out of a volleyball. And so from that movie, it's communicating a deep truth. I Am Legend is another movie that does that. And Will Smith is, you know, a lot of some ladies there, he's standing on an island as well, the island of Manhattan. And... He creates all these mannequins, right, in a video store that he engages with and talks to. Because he needs another human being. And he even talks to his dog as well. And so we we're hardwired for community. We're hardwired for fellowship. And that's, that's what this is telling us. You know, it helps us keep up with others. You know, social media does that. I mean, years ago, you know, you come to a place like this, all I am. And you can make friends, but you never really thought you'd get to kind of keep up with them unless you were pen pals or something which never really works all that well. But now you can meet people here, and you can be friends with them on Facebook and so much keep up with them. And who knows, maybe you go off to college with them and room with them later. Um, you know, guys, you don't need to try to find a girlfriend here and vice versa. It's not going to work, I promise you. You'll be embarrassed, you'll look back on it and just think that was so silly that I actually tried to make this work. So I just wanted to discourage that. As I'm emphasizing community connecting, don't do that. I promise it's not going to work. You'll be embarrassed. Um, <clears throat> so, the internet provides us community. Um, it also provides us access to information. Like I said, we're created in the image of an all knowing God. So, look, you desire knowledge because you're created in the image of an intelligent God. Why do you think you look up so many things on the internet? You, you desire this information because God knows everything and we're created in, in His image. We want to know things. We want to research things. And so we have all this 
this access to information. Look, you can you know, look up the weather. You can look up what movies are coming out. You can look up restaurants in the area with ratings, whether or not it's good. You can know the 37th president of the United States and who won you know, the, the 15th Super Bowl. You can look up all of these things in a matter of seconds. You have all this information. Look, you have the entire Bible on your phone. You have something that took thousands of years to write, and many people to write, is now just available pretty much 24-7 because you take your smartphone with you wherever you go to them. Um, so you, you have this access to, to all of this information. Um, you don't have to drive to the library to look up things. Simply just type it in and look it up, and again, seconds you've got it. I'm a hard guy. Uh, I think it's Les Mason one time says, you know, that the friendly argument is now over with. You know, not too long ago, some, some friends could be discussing something and could have a disagreement about who won, I don't know, the 20th Super Bowl. I think it's this thing. I think it's this thing. And they would just say, okay, kind of agree to disagree. But now you can just say, well, let's see who won the 20th Super Bowl. Type it in and you've got it right there. So that's kind of gone now. Um, so not only that, we evangelism. Um, you know, it offers opportunities. The internet offers opportunities to witness to other people. Now, I have a blog that I work on with some other guys, and we're we're amazed by God's grace that we can minister to people in countries we've never visited. Um, it's, it's typically 15 countries a day have, have, have seen things that we've put out there. It's just mind blowing that the Lord can use that to share His gospel to the ends of the earth. Because the internet is reaching the ends of the earth. And we know that evangelism can be an awkward thing. Um, we took our senior high youth on uh, a mission trip uh, just a few weeks ago, and we did some evangelism, just going up to complete strangers and sharing the gospel. Every one of us, including myself, is nervous. Because, you know, what are they going to, what if they disagree with you? What if they get into an audience? What if I can't think of, you know, the right words to say? Evangelism can be an awkward thing. And, and even though that's true, we still need to do it, but the internet offers it, makes it a little more, a little easier, a little more comfortable for you to do that. Um, you can share articles on Facebook. Um, that's the plan of the priest. You can put Bible verses up there. Uh, it makes evangelism a little easier. Um, also, just convenience. Um, the internet, you know, you don't have to leave your house to go shopping anymore. You don't have to leave your house to go rent movies. Um, they used to have a store called Blockbuster that we used to have to go to. It's such an inconvenience. And just, you know, go through all the, the different movies they have. And now you can just sit at your house and download a movie and watch it all by iTunes or Amazon or whatever you want to do. And just along with this convenience, you know, there, there are six other electives that are all around. Thank you all for choosing this one. Glad to, to see you all here. But you're missing out on some other electives. But when you go back home after this retreat, they'll put these up on the internet, and you can listen to all these other lectures that you missed out on. There are many convenient things that we have because of the internet, which is a blessing. Um, something, a topic I'll get into a little bit more when we talk about movies is, is the fact that we're sub-creators. You know, again, we're created in the image of God, and so we're we're created to be creators as well, sub-creators. Look, it gives us the opportunity to exercise. You know, creativity in our mind. Think about it. I and mean, we have people making movies now. Everybody's a director, right? You can make your own movie on YouTube. Uh, you can make television shows. You know, some of my guys were talking about um, how it should have ended. Just seen any of those on, on YouTube where it parts into the kind of, you know, poke fun of movies that have been released, like Iron Man 3 and others, and they changed the ending. You know, we can all create these things. You can, you know, go to use GarageBand and make music so uh, that, that's, that's, that's a good thing that the internet allows us to exercise this creativity because we are called to cultivate creation and the internet helps us to fulfill that now let's look at the bag um, I was trying to think of what picture to put up there for the bag um, figure this bag baby might be kind of cute as we talk about something kind of bad I think it's the hair it kind of makes that picture just bring everything together. Um, and his bottom left is pretty cute. <clears throat> what are some bad things about the internet? Somebody, so raise your hand and tell me a few things that are bad about the internet. You 
can go first. Yes, all kinds of bad things on the internet. Pornography. Inappropriate videos. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a, a book called Sexual Detox by Tim Challenge, which is a really good book. You know, with pornography. And he, he talks about the fact that, you know, now pornography comes looking for you. You don't even have to look for it. You just type in seemingly innocent things and things pop up. We know that. So, yeah. Those are just a few of the evils. Some of those we'll get into um, in just a minute. Um, kind of, I guess one of the biggest ones is the fact that it's a false god. In many ways, the internet or smartphone technology is a false god. You know, Exodus 20. Can somebody tell me what was going on in Exodus 20? Revival of trivia. Ten commandments. Yeah. Sorry, you raised your hand. Probably gonna get that. Um, so what's the first commandment? Okay. Yeah. Keeping God first, ultimately. And what, is, what that implies because we're sinners is that we're going to make false gods contain us. We're going to worship everything other than God because we're broken, because we're sinful. And so, here's a picture here of a father trying to pry his son away from his computer. That's his false god. Um, and so when we're talking about false gods, what we think of addiction and idolatry. Um, there's a very smart man who has some books back there on the table named Ed Welch. And listen to this. As you, as you think, am I addicted to the internet? Am I addicted to my cell phone? He says an addiction, and I'll go ahead and say yes you are, um, an addiction, he says, is ultimately a worship disorder. An addiction is a worship disorder. Like you've been created to worship God, but because of your sin, you worship everything else. You worship your boyfriend. You worship your girlfriend. You worship your cell phone. You worship music, money, possession, your body, athletics academic, fill in the blank. We are constantly turning out new idols all the time. So the question is not, will you worship? The question is, what are you worshiping? Because we are created to be worshipers. Put the idolatry taking place here. All the life for your picture can easily and quickly turn into an idol. How many people have liked my picture? I've got to get this certain amount of life. It's idolatry. Um, you know, when you're pulling your, your, your smartphone out to check Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to see if you've got text messages, you're not bowing down to these things, but you are worshiping these things. Um, you, you know, our, our youth group, we don't allow our youth group uh, to bring cell phones to Junior Island. Uh, we ban all electronics so we can actually fellowship. There you go. Huh and get to know each other, you know, the human beings sitting beside us. Um, and it's, it's a tough thing. Our youth group handles it well. Um, but it is, when you remove that, you realize how addicted you are to it. Look, uh, for a test, go home after this week and just say, okay, I'm taking a week fast from my cell phone. See if you can do it. Um, and see how that draws you, hopefully, closer to the Lord. Um, a good way to, to, to discover your idol a good question to ask yourself to discover your idol. Ask yourself what makes you mad. What makes me mad? That typically shows what idolatry is going on in our hearts. Guys, for example, sports teams. When someone makes fun of the team you pull for and you get angry, that shows it's your idol. And I've seen guys red faced screaming at other guys in there. Sports team is being made fun of. That is your false God. I thought, man, if we can just get people that passionate about Jesus Christ, that would be awesome. So that's our false God. Girls, maybe it's the fact that another girl is getting attention from another guy. That makes you mad. Because you want that guy to worship you instead of her. Maybe it's the fact that all the girls in your group are giving attention to this one girl and not you. To be accepted, that's your idol. And guys, you, you deal with that as well. But all of you, oftentimes that's why you get mad when somebody tries to take your cell phone from you. 
when your parents ground you from that, they know that's the way to your heart. It's taking your cell phone away. Um, and so that's your that's your idol. That's a false god that you're addicting to, addicted to worshiping. And look, the reason we get so angry when our false gods are attacked is because our false gods are weak and worthless. They cannot defend themselves. God wants us to stand up for Him and defend Him, obviously, so He can defend Himself. He's powerful enough to defend Himself. Your football team is not able to do that. None of your other false gods are able to do that. There's only one true guy, and He can defend Himself. So that, that's the first evil, is the false god. Now, stewardship is an issue we have to look at when dealing with bad things. Uh, now, what is a steward? It's someone who's been entrusted to take care of something. That's ultimately what a steward is. Look for an example. How many of you have been paid to keep somebody's pet while they were away? Okay, so raise them high. Let me see. How many of you have done that? To feed a dog or a cat? We're currently housing a fish at our house with some friends. Um, just imagine if they said, hey, we're going to be gone for two weeks, feed our dog, they come back and you just hand them a dead dog and say, I forgot to feed your dog. Sorry. Would you be a good steward or a bad steward? Bad. Bad steward. But look, something that's interesting that somebody pointed out, this guy named Burke Parsons said, a bad steward is oxymoronic. Because a bad steward is no steward at all. Look, you're either a steward or you're not. There's no such thing as a bad steward. So look, God has entrusted His creation to you. Look, your body is not your body. It's His body. So you're to steward it for His glory. Look, your brain is not your brain to waste. It's His brain. So you're to take care of it. That's why you need to do your homework and study. Because it's not your brain to waste. Another big thing He gives us is time. He is giving you a limited number of seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years. Right now, there's a clock somewhere, and it's the clock of your life, and it is ticking down to zero. You only have a certain amount of time left on this earth. And so again, it's not your, your time to waste. You're to steward that. So, that means one day, you will stand before the Creator of this earth and give an account to every second you spend on the earth. That's, that's a, some pretty heavy, yeah, that's a pretty heavy thought, a pretty weighty thought to think about. Therefore, let's look up here, what are some of these things? Have you ever played Dumb Ways to Die? It's currently the most downloaded app on iTunes, and now all of you will download it. You don't have it. Um, Minecraft, Temple Run, I could put Angry Birds up there, but I think Angry Birds is kind of done with, right? Everybody kind of getting done with that? Um, so look, these things are fun. These things can be, you know, I mean, it does, again, creativity. Um, but really, should we, should we spend hours playing these things? You know, people around us are perishing and need to know about Jesus Christ. And we're spending hours. Yeah, you know, I mean, I know some guys who, who so they spent like eight hours playing Minecraft. But it's a fake world. That means nothing. And it will crumble. It's a false kingdom. You know, it doesn't even have that great of graphics, right? It's called keys. And you have a guy who runs in one direction forever. And you can even, I mean, you can even, like, trick it to where it just keeps going. And, yeah, anyway, it's fun to play these things. I don't want to, don't want to keep guilt on you. Um, but, I mean, when you think about the fact that Jesus Christ bled on a cross to purchase these seconds for us, we're spending them on stuff like this. That is kind of a sobering thought. Um, and I mean, think about it. When we talk about time, like, if you talk about wasting time, we typically use words like, oh, I just killed some time. And think of the violent language we use there. We know that it's not something that just wastes, so we say we killed it. Time is valuable, so we need to be good stewards of our time. Now look, we have all kinds of, an, another bad is, all kinds of relational issues come out of, you know, social media. Like I said, it can foster community, but the internet, social media, can and often does damage relationships. 
I mean, think about how many times people have misunderstood what you were trying to say over text messages. They thought you were mad, and then you're like, no, 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 I wasn't mad. But they just misunderstood you. Because you can't tell, you know, intonation over a text message. Um, you know, our Facebook chat. Hey, look up at, at this thing here. It says, thanks for the birthday wishes from everyone who noticed my name today in the upper right corner of your Facebook page. I'm um, kind of joking about the fact, you know, the, the happy birthday as we get on Facebook now. So, like, you are now obligated to wish everybody happy birthday. If they know you got on Facebook and you didn't write it on their wall, you're in trouble. Um, and, 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 and look, if everybody wishes you a happy birthday, which mine's next week, just leave right on my wall, happy birthday. Um, if, if I don't use the proper etiquette and thank everybody for wishing me all these you know, warm wishes on my birthday, people won't wish me happy birthday next year. So there's, there's all this etiquette that we have to follow now. Now look, that can be sweet to wish people happy birthday, obviously. Um, but we know without a doubt, people can get frustrated at that, and it has happened. It's called issues. You know, if people, if you follow people on Twitter, Instagram, and they don't follow you back, you get frustrated. If you text somebody and they don't text you back like within two seconds, you know, what's going on? How are they mad at me? Why don't they text me back? I can't believe that. Well, we'll get. You know, frustrated. I even read an article where somebody unfriended another person on Facebook and they killed them. They killed them. That's insane. Um, that really happened. There's just something about face-to-face contact that is necessary for human relationships. We were created to look at someone in the eyes and talk to them. But now we have a screen in between us to separate us. Look, guys are saying bolder things to girls that are faithful or text messages so they don't have to look them in the eye. And girls are saying bolder things to guys so you don't have to look them in the, in the face. I mean, I've had students come up to me and say, this guy or this girl is, is always saying these things you know, over text messages but they never talk to me when I actually see them. That's because they don't know how to have a conversation unless there's a screen in front of them. There's something about face-to-face connection that we just need. So the relational issues. And this is another one I saw on Twitter. It says this is how girls flirt in the modern age. By liking a picture or you know, favoriting a comment or a tweet. Um, now, that kind of seems somewhat ridiculous. Um, but we know there's some truth here. We know some people think, okay, I'll just, this girl keeps liking all my pictures or this guy keeps liking all my pictures or, or favoriting my tweets. There's, so now, this is now flirting going on, um, you know, to some people. This is a big deal. Um, this is how you can subtly show you're interested in somebody. Now, tell me what's going on here. Can someone, can someone take a guess at what this is? They're having a party? Oh, I somebody say it again. Okay. It's a selfie of a selfie of a selfie. All right? Um, now, selfies can be, you know, a good and somewhat innocent and just kind of a fun thing. Um, but I think sometimes we're overlooking the, the sin that can be going on with selfies sometimes. Yes, we think about Scripture, what it says, that our hearts are deceitful above all else. But we are created, I mean, because of sin, in a, we are selfish people, we are self-centered, and our number one idol is ourselves. We worship ourselves. And so, selfies are really just feeding our obsession with ourselves. Um, I mean, I know you've seen it on, on Facebook, on Instagram, hundreds of pictures of this person basically making the same face over and over again, but a slight variation of their self. And you just kind of think, like, how long are these people sit in front of a mirror looking at themselves and just kind of changing the variation of themselves. Not to mention, you know, the other hundreds of selfies that didn't make the final cut to the selfie list on Instagram or Facebook. Um, you know, this is something that we, we need to think about because we are naturally selfish. Just examine your heart on that. I'm not saying stop making selfies, stop, stop taking selfies, um, but, but kind of question your heart on that. Am I being too self-focused? Am I feeding my obsession with myself? And again, just keep in mind Scripture saying your heart is deceitful. Above all, it will deceive you. So be cautious. 
So these are selfishness. Um, now sexual sin, this is kind of the, the obvious one that, that got brought up. Um, we, we typically think of pornography when we think of sexual sin, you know, on, on the internet. And just kind of a sobering word, you know, we, it's everywhere. Um, yeah, it is a poison. I've lived long enough to see older men, you know, telling other men it has almost destroyed their marriage. And I know women who want to divorce their husbands because of this issue. Because what it is is adultery, ultimately. This is so serious. And, and you know, I told Joe to be sure, you know, talking about this, and, you know, we've got guys and girls in here. I know we've got middle schoolers, and I won't get too detailed in this, other than just warning you and begging and pleading with you to be careful. Um, statistically speaking, Guys are exposed to their first pornographic image in fifth grade. So statistically speaking, every guy in here has seen a pornographic image. And pornography is a growing statistic among females. Um, it is a poison. It is deadly. If you think you've got it under control and you're just kind of messing around with it a little bit, I promise you it will, it will hurt you bad and it will hurt others. So that's just a sobering warning to be careful because typically so we, we, we think of porn but also non-explicit porn but some of you justify the fact that well they're not naked you know and they've got their clothes on or it's kind of sensual but it's not really pornography um, but it doesn't have to be explicit to get you to sin PG-13 movies for example you know that they major on the implicit you know, to, to get you to lust after certain people. They can, again, be fully clothed and they can still cause you to sin. Because, again, the human form is powerful. Um, and so you, you need to realize that. And look, even if, let's just say you never actually look at what you know, the culture would label as porn, let's say you're, you're just going to say you're not going to look at that. You still can be a sin at looking at some of these implicit images. Not to, not to mention the fact that after a while, these implicit images are probably going to start getting old, and it's a slippery slope where you start looking at more graphic pictures. Um, so, kind of the, the non explicit porn, um, something to think about. Also, um, you know, Man Candy Monday on Twitter. Um, yeah, some of y'all might have seen this hashtag, you know. Um, you know, you just kind of question what's going on in people's hearts. You know? Um, I just remember, you know, being shocked when, when Thor came out. Alright, yeah, Thor, lady. Um, and I just saw this, this one girl who used to be in my youth group in college just describing how beautiful, you know, Chris Hemsworth was. Is. Um, and it was kind of, like, embarrassing. I was thinking, okay, hundreds of people are reading this and you're just putting it out there. Um, you know, I, I think we've got to be cautious with, with you know, like things like Man Candy Monday. You, you just put up beautiful pictures of guys. You know, it's okay to admire beauty. You know, Kurt Cooper's continuing to admire Stacey Cross in the band. It's okay, right? You know, it's okay to admire beautiful people. Um, but sometimes, like, Man Candy Monday, things like that just can be somewhat sinful. Um... And again, our hearts are deceitful, so we need to be cautious on these things. You know, I put something here, online flirting. You know, the, the picture we part of, put up a few minutes ago of, uh, you know, liking some of these pictures or favoriting some of these pictures. You know, being cautious. If that is the way that you do flirt, you know, flirting we think of as innocent, but I, I tend to think it's, it's more simple than innocent, often, oftentimes. Um, you know, I mean, just, just think about what's going on sometimes. You, you know, you don't just imagine a scenario where you're in a restaurant and a guy is just sitting in a chair across the room from you staring at you for 10 minutes. Is that weird? Yes. So that's what's going on with your Instagram and Facebook. Guys that you don't even know are just staring at you, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, just looking at pictures of you. That's kind of weird, right? But we just put those pictures out there for everybody to see. See, once you remove the screen, and it happens in real life, it's weird. <laughs> but when you put the screen there, it's not awkward, right? 
And so we're, we're kind of cultivating these, these thoughts in our minds that aren't all that awkward, that should be awkward. And strange. Um, now, you know, we've got our profile here. That's not my name, it's John, but this is John Appleseed, I just Googled that. Um, from, from Twitter. Um, this is something that's false mediator. Um, now, now, what is a mediator? It's something that stands between us and somebody else. You know, Christ is our mediator. He's perfectly righteous. We're sinful. He stands between us and God. Therefore, God sees us as righteous because He's standing in between us. Look, take Facebook, for example. You put pictures of yourself on Facebook that you want people to see. You, you like certain things on Facebook that will make you, you know, look cool. You, you, you know, follow certain pages, you listen to certain music that, that is cool and acceptable, or the movies that are cool, you know, you follow things that other people follow, or, you know, the reverse is true, you try to follow the things nobody else follows, and like the bands nobody else follows, so you can be unique and cool, just like everybody else. Um, the same is true on Instagram, and on Tumblr, and on Feed, and Vine, and every... But your social media is your mediator. It's standing between you and the other person. That is, you know, you know, one of your friends starts following you on Instagram, they're not literally following you. I mean, just imagine you walking around and 20 people are following you. That's weird and they'd get arrested, obviously. So they're not literally following you, they're following your false, you know, mediator, the, the image that you've created. And so the, the, the popularity of social media, the fact that millions of people, I mean everybody, the celebrities, everybody is on Instagram, Twitter. It shows that every human being realizes they need to be recreated. And we're always trying to recreate ourselves. We're trying to make this image that we want other people to see. Um, because we are, we are each each one of us is broken. We ultimately need to be recreated to Jesus Christ through His image. Because it's, you know, Kurt Cooper said, you're all precious, cute, beautiful snowflakes with your parents. Just love. But at the same time, you're all ugly. You are. Because you are rent with sin. It's all over you. And so ultimately, you need the blood of Jesus Christ to recreate you. And I think it, you know, this illustrates that. Um, the fact that we you know, are longing for all these followers. I mean, just the language there. Jesus Christ has followers, right? Now we have followers. Uh, people are following us, worshiping us. So this desire to be recreated, like I said. So the solution, almost through here, this is where we take the good aspect of the internet. And I was just hammering on the bad. So it's kind of remember the good that we talked about. In light of the bad, and how do we redeem this? How do we interact? Because we can't just dismiss this, even with all the evils out there. The Internet's not going away, obviously. Um, grow your understanding of God. This is the first solution. So look at it. Grow your understanding of God. That's the image of Alpha and Omega there. Um, but we need to have a God-centered mindset as we're on the Internet. You need to to realize you are always interacting with God. You never stop interacting with Him. Every word you speak, every comment you make, every image you look at is ultimately interacting with God. You never make a decision that's independent of God. A man named David Callison said, every second of your life is either exercising faith or idolatry. So that means the second when you stop exercising faith, you're exercising idolatry. It's just so serious in how big our idolatry is. Um, oftentimes, you know, God doesn't even seem like enough. And so that, that's why we're oftentimes searching for so much on the Internet. We're always searching. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for identity. We're looking for companionship. And so as you're growing and cultivating this understanding of God, realize you are always interacting with Him even when you forget that He's in the room with you. You are never separated from the all-seeing eye of God. God sees everything. Look at this quote from J.C. Ryle. Somewhat adapted. It says, The sound of a footstep coming has stopped many a deed of wickedness. Look, you're in your room or wherever, you think nobody's around, you hear footsteps coming, 
you know, minimize the browser, get out of it, pull something else up. A knock at the door has caused many an evil work to be quickly stopped. But this is all foolishness. There is an all-seeing witness with a capital W with us wherever we go. Lock the door, close the blinds, shut the shutters, put out the candle. It matters not. It makes no difference. God is everywhere. You cannot shut Him out or prevent His seeing. But just being blunt here, some of you guys should be beaten for the way that you talk about girls on the internet and for the things that you look at on the internet. Some of you guys should be slapped around for, for the things that you look at on the internet. That's just being completely blunt. And some of you, you know, think you get away with the nasty words that you speak and the images that you look at. We have a God who sees all. We need to cultivate this fear of God. Look, I mean, just think of this example. Do you think an earthly father would get angry if you talked nasty about his daughter? I guarantee you this father would. He would take you out to the woodshed. Look, there's another father, a heavenly father, who created all of the girls in the earth. He gets angrier when they're disgraced, when they're not honored. You need to cultivate this fear of God. Um, you, you know, I mean, Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Look, he, he sees every post, everything you look at, every thought that comes into your mind. And look, in His Word explicitly tells us He has the power to throw people into hell. The question isn't, you know, why should we fear God? The question is, why don't we fear Him more? We can't hide from Him. And the fact that God hates sin. You know, sometimes we minimize that. You know, God absolutely hates sin. But the, but the way, I mean, we know this, we can say this, we know this is true, but the way that we live on the Internet seems to forget that sometimes. The, the words that we just kind of throw out there seem to, to forget that. You, you know, many of us don't even think about the fact that, that God's in the room with us as we're looking at these things or saying these things. So again, the way you interact with the Internet communicates something about your relationship with God. Look, if you're so concerned with your image on Facebook, if you're so concerned with how many people are following you, or how many likes you're getting, it communicates something about God. It communicates that He isn't all you truly need. You may say He's your Savior. You may say that He's all that you truly need. But, but again, oftentimes our, our behavior on the internet is, show, is communicating the exact opposite. It communicates that our identity isn't secure in Him, and it is. We need to rest in that. You don't need to try to recreate yourself. Jesus Christ has already done that for you. He is the being. He took on flesh, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died a perfect death. So now you don't have to do that. So when God sees you, He loves you. He claims that you're His. And you don't have to try to earn His faith. It's accomplished. It's done. And so as we're looking at the solution, and I'm closing here, as we're, we're growing our understanding of God, pray. Pray that you'll know Him. Ask that you will know Him, that you'll want to know Him more. I mean, you, you can't know Him completely this side of heaven. Pray that you'll want to know Him more. Pray that you'll want to to love Him more and to fear Him more. Look, again, if you were His child, He loves you because you are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. But, but some of you here might not know Him as your Lord and Savior. And so all of these, you know, we've talked about the bad, I know it's a sobering thing because it's such a part of our lives, but I hope it scares you. I hope it does. Because, you know, we have a holy God who hates sin. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're not covered in His blood. You're in danger. You know, talk to your youth workers. Um, talk to somebody. If you're not sure about that, talk to me. Talk to anybody. Um, because this is a sobering reality. Um, so again, I know this is a lot to take in in a short amount of time. We're out of time. We've got to end kind of abruptly. If you have any questions, you know, write them down. You can turn them to me. Let me close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together. Lord, I pray, Lord, that 
It's encouraging to be reminded that you are sovereign as we looked at in the beginning, that you're over all of this, Lord, and there is good in the internet just as there is evil. Lord, give us the wisdom uh, to know how to interact with. Help us to grow our understanding of you. Help us to love you more, to know you more, to fear you like we should. Now, thank you so much that, that you didn't leave us for ourselves to do this all on, your, on our own. That you humbled yourself and came to this earth and saved us from our sin. Thank you all for coming.